All right, so let's do it. Episode three of the other Russian. So today I want to talk about thing like male ego, and this is a very touchy topic. <laughs> As it turns out, across any population and the entire globe, pretty much, because while we're while we were, while we were doing the study, the, the research for a project in India, we came to realize that uh, pretty much India is just a patriarchal society governed by ancient laws, pretty much in a sense. Manus uh, or I may be mistaken here in terms of terminology and still navigating it. However, those scripts were written like thousands of years ago and um, they were written by men basically. So this is the problem. So the society leaves according to the standards written by men. And this is pretty much the same bias that um, happens with AI, really because the majority of data is written, governed by men. And there's been a really interesting, peculiar case involving like this machine learning or, I don't know, AI or how does it work, I don't really get it. So there's been an issue with the, the LinkedIn post that I've um, made at some point in time to kind of announce that initiative. And um, like that post was made on June 27th. So at some point in time, I think like two days ago, like on 23rd, when I had a meeting with uh, people from NGOs, I realized on that particular day that there's been a very massive mistake made in the algorithms. So those algorithms basically kind of canceled women. And you can think and say like, what the fuck is this Russian guy talking about? Like, seriously, how can algorithm cancel women? But I can prove it to you. So I need to do some manipulation with my PC. And I'm currently recording this using MacBook. But I have a second screen, which is located here. So I'll be looking here from time to time to demonstrate my, um, my entire screen. But I wanted to highlight one thing, which kind of strange in a sense, but there it goes. So you can see my screen now. So this is this is my profile, and if you scroll down and find this initiative. So what you kind of see here is that this overview of this project dedicates women, right? Okay. So let me make a copy of that link to this post and see project dedicated to activity what like seriously how in the world women became an activity i uh, don't get it i mean maybe you do um if you do please do let me know how does it work because um, i had this really weird idea of reaching out to Bill Gates because he is founder of Microsoft and Microsoft is the company that now owns LinkedIn. So I get cancelled in, in, in Russia, if I remember, I, I think I mentioned before. So there is some background to it. However, that's not the case. And as you can see, women get cancelled because, I don't know, again, it's my assumption, I may be wrong here completely, but why algorithms decided to kind of replace women with activity? This is the question. I mean, it's not like the conspiracy theory or anything. I mean, there are reasons to it, I bet. I bet there's some sort of a mechanism or some sort of an algorithm that somehow decides that uh, a link should be different. How does it work? I don't know. So I'm going to try and reach out to some people to, you know, bring it to their attention. But other than that, it's like very strange. So yeah, let's go back to the topic. So the topic of the male ego, so the, the thing that I was talking about is that the societies are governed by men, and uh, men are very insecure beings. Their ego is fucking like a, I, I don't know how to put it, like crystal ball. And it can break if you breathe on it. It can fall into pieces if you kind of say something about it and if male ego is touched then you know um, we need to dig deeper into the, the sex and the, how it's being perceived and how people identify with sex but this is this 
so-called Western propaganda machine. However, they do raise a really interesting topic of awareness. And awareness is something that is pretty much deep rooted in, in India in general and in the East because I mean, if you've heard of Buddha, you may know that he appeared in India. So there's this ancient practice called Vipassana that I mentioned to you about, and I've been there. And um, it's different, it's liberating in terms of perceiving reality as it is without making any judgments or assumptions about it. And it is completely not connected with all those scriptures or those guidelines according to which people live mainly. So the reason I brought it to the topic is that once you go through it, you realize that, that there is no need to claim for something. And if you think about it, I mean, why wars start? Like, seriously, <laughs> because of somebody's ego? So you look at this guy who is ruling Russia, and, um, you know, the dude's got big ego and he's got major concerns. But what if, what if he was liberated from that ego and the need to cling to it and to save face and to play the male dominant and shit like that? Wouldn't the world be a different place? Like, seriously. If there was no ego, but have you, have you ever heard of, like, female ego that you know, got hurt to that extent to start a war. I don't know. I mean, I got four out of five in history. I wasn't that good, but, you know, maybe I missed something. However, that's the thing that keeps bothering me, because, again, going back to this patriarchal society, the biggest kind of revelation in the sense is that within the matriarchy, there is patriarchy. And this is like whole next level of comprehension like what <laughs> so it is so deep rooted it is so kind of underpins their core society the core of society and the core principles according to which people live and it's just amazing so the thing is it is really hard to do anything about it because again world is run by men, right? So wherever you look, there are men that are leading countries mainly. There are some exceptions, of course, like Estonia, for instance, or uh, I'm afraid to make a mistake here, but Moldova may be mistaken here anyway. So, I mean, not only women, and of course, if you look at uh, Indian history, there was Indira Gandhi at some point in time as the first um, female pr premier minister. But she was killed, unfortunately. So, we'll never know what could have been the potential there and the um, potential changes that she could have brought on board if she wasn't killed. But I have a feeling that, I mean, again, I may be wrong, but she got killed because of some male ego got in the way. Somebody felt hurt. Somebody felt dishonored. Somebody felt offended. And this is like deep-rooted trauma that somebody haven't gone through because if they did they wouldn't have done it in the first place like seriously if you go to a psychologist if you uh, take substances to extend the perception of your mind you come to realize that ego is just a construct but if you kind of change your perception towards it it is just a word. It is hard to get rid of it. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. And of course, I as well as a male, female, uh, male, cisgender, heterosexual man, I feel this because in my relationships, sometimes I do react not in a proper manner. But at some point in time, I remember my, my wife told me that I'm a victim of the patriarchal society. Whatever the fuck that meant at that point in time, no, sorry, I mean, of course, I did ask her the question, she did give it an explanation. However, at the moment, it was hard to comprehend. And it happened maybe a month and a half ago while we were tripping on that LSD, I guess, or something like that. So we were having this conversation and she said it and it, it stuck with me. And I've been thinking ever since. And I, to come to realize that, uh, yeah, she was right. I mean, I'm behaving according to the patterns. And I've recently been on this online workshop called uh, 
oh, what's the name of it? Like something breaking patriarchal patterns or something like that. It was guided by two people. So there was one lady from Spain. She's been in change management for, I don't know, a decade or 16 years or so. And there was this guy, Indian guy, who was doing the meditation, like concentrating on your feelings and shit like that. So it was a two hour session and it was really interesting because there were some patterns in there and uh, whether we wanted it or not we we're following them basically and um, the interesting thing is that in the majority of cases we're not aware of it aware of it so where i'm leading with this thought is that um the other day when i was discussing the project in the last episode with the representative of ngo charka so ayushi and kushi thank you for it for your time so they told me about um, the workshops, the educational workshops that they do in schools and the topics that they discuss. So I had a question for them, like, uh, when typically does this light bulb moment happen? Like, at what particular moment people realize there is something different to it? And I'm gonna just find this specific... Yeah, so... So the topics that they mention is when they speak with people about such concept as individualism and uh, everything that is related to it, like individuality, like somebody being an individual, having their own unique sets of character attributions or however they called. And um, at this point in time, people start to think differently about the sex and about the borders and everything. So there is this other concept that they also mentioned. Well, mindfulness, of course, which makes sense. I mean, once, again, you've been to Vipassana, you won't go through this endless suffering, pretty much. Um, and other thing, like power within, or power up within and over so power over somebody when you exercise your power by you know either imposing patriarchal patterns or maybe it is power within that uh, has uh, that sits within you and helps you to you know not do something because it, you have it, all of us have this power and the power up is that if i written it correctly though <laughs> i may be mistaken here but nevertheless so power up is like when we are being powered Shit. Power, yeah, no, so power over us, so power up. Uh, anyway, so one is uh, at us, the other one is we exercise power, and the third one is within that we have this power to do or not do something. And there is this other concept of, uh, well, consent, of course, which makes total sense because in the, in the majority of schools it's, it's not taught in any way. Well, at least in India, I don't remember that in Russia anybody told me about consent, about boundaries in school or about like sexual education. I, I mean, I remember that we had this concept of male, male and female parts, but I don't really remember that somebody even told us about female menstruation and what it is and how it works and things like this. So I didn't definitely get it from school. I got it from some other place. But yeah, going back to the topic of the ego thing, so the topic I want to talk about today is psychedelics. Fucking finally, this guy is talking about psychedelics, but this is something that I love, so <laughs> buckle up. So I've been using psychedelics for many years, really, and the uh, first experience was somewhere around 2007-ish, not sure about that. And it was, I don't even remember what it was, but ever since I've had, like, a certain amount of psychedelics, well, not that certain really, <laughs> some amount of psychedelics. So anyway, the, the reason I want to talk about it is that they helped me. They helped me a lot to deal with my trauma and I got into it so much that I started to gather information. So I started to read articles and uh, even read books. So I got to read Stanislav Grof, which is a founder of uh, transpersonal psychology at some point in time. So what happened? Basically, if you watch TV show or TV series by Netflix called How to Change Your Mind, this is it. Like, this is the renaissance of psychedelics that I've been waiting for. It. It's, it's fucking happening during my life. Time. So this is just amazing. So I want to tell you a story. So I had uh, this... Um, education um so yeah i have like my specialist degree it's a five-year education at the uh, euro state technical university dedicated to project management human talent faculty then had like additional education in strategic marketing i don't remember how much how long it lasted like a year or two not sure 
maybe year or something like that anyway and the worst is another course that it went on it was um, basically around psychology so this is a two-year education on psychological consulting well like you are being the consultant like you are helping people as a psychologist basically so within this two-year program they had this uh, very intense education and there were like I don't know roughly 15 different variations of psychotherapies or psycho directions or psychological brands or names or whatever I don't even know how to call them but anyway so they gave you the theory well me and then 70% of uh, learning was done through practice so we've been practicing various types of uh, therapies basically it's like um, the family drama like uh, what's this called in English, uh, like touching therapy, dancing therapy, art therapy, psychoanalysis, and I don't even remember them all. So at some point in time there were like people in the auditory, if I remember correctly, roughly 50 or 60, something like that, and um, the course was compiled of different people, like really different, so there were like really young students uh, so at that point in time I was no longer that young I think it was like uh, shit, was it like? I was 26 so there were like people of like 20 and something but then they, uh, there were women of older age like a lot of women I mean mainly women rather than men of course typically go to psychology uh, but I don't know stereotypes somehow because I guess they are the heal <laughs> healers of trauma in the sense of the patriarchal society but yeah uh, jokes aside so we were tasked with uh, reading a book and then just deliver a short version of it, what it was and who was the author and shit like that. So I decided to go with Stanislav Grof because I like that guy. I mean, what happened basically is that when Albert Hoffman invented LSD whilst working in Sanders, he, uh, well, he or Sanders, I don't know exactly who made the decision, they basically shipped boxes of LSD to various psychologists around the US and told them look guys we found something it messes with your mind can you tell us what it is and whether or not you can use it in your therapy so Stanislav Grof was among the first batch the pioneers that got this this pa package or parcel or however you call it so he did the experiments he immediately recognized the potential value of it and then he started using it and at some point in time with the EP wave and everything so if you watch that tv series on netflix you can see it in the first episode when i watched it like a month and a half ago i knew roughly 70 to 75 percent of what was said but there were some like new stuff that i enjoyed uh, about LSD so that the entire episode is one hour long and like dedicated to LSD as a substance so they provide you with data they provide you with research with uh, in they interview psychologists who use it as a tool for the therapy and then um, they give you all this data they show a uh, patient side so there are patients talking with uh, the, I don't know, the cameraman whoever about their experience and uh, what it did to them Yeah, sorry, I need to freshen up a bit. So anyway, um, and then once it got banned with the hippies and everything, so US government decided to ban the substance because it's drug and people are against war in Vietnam, like fucking hippies need to cut them off their supply chain and then they'll settle up, which pretty much worked because once you make it illegal, you start to enforce it and then, you know, people go to jail and nobody wants to kind of consume out in the open because it will raise questions like where did we get it from so I decided to go with Stanislav Grof and um, I don't remember exactly the book he wrote like shitload of books I read like two or three of them and then uh, when he delivered the speech about that book so the, I decided to kind of go further and I said that Stanislav Grof was strongly advocating for the use of psychedelics in therapy so once I said that the, the lady in charge of this uh, education program and she's a psychologist with her I don't know like 20 30 whatever years of experience at that time so she looked like 50 -ish or 60 or something like that and you know you could tell that she's like deep into psychology but uh, she's a bit orthodox because Russia is generally in a fucking orthodox country so after I said that she said hold on a second he never said that and all 50, 60 people sitting in there just hear this from her. And I gotta tell you, I didn't have the guts to quarrel with her. 
simply because of two reasons. Um, I didn't want to say out loud because in the auditory there was this lady, she was, I don't know, 55 or 60 or something, and she's like ex law enforcement person. And I was like, what am I gonna fucking do here, right? Am I gonna quarrel and make a case and tell her that I'm a drag addict or something like that so that, you know, I'd raise questions and things like this, but then in my mind, I do remember watching that fucking video where Stanislav Grof was fucking advocating for the use of psychedelics in therapy. So, I knew that I was right, but, eh, well, I mean, I guess my ego wasn't touched here, or I didn't give a shit enough to, you know, just stand up and make the case. I mean, maybe it'd be possible to help at the point. I, who knows, who knows. Anyway, so the point here is that it is a very touchy topic, and typically it's widely stigmatized again due to many like obvious reasons like laws and law enforcement and people going to jail but as of recently with that actually book that was the kind of kickstarter or maybe there was something else like a series of events or just happening in the parallel something like that like when the telephone got invented it wasn't invented in one place it was invented in two places irrespectively of each other interdependently and just or not interdependently uh, completely independent of each other so um maybe just a series of events that led to it and then all make it happen so that there's like a new topic to discuss the psychedelic renaissance and i fully enjoy it i'm fully on board with it because i fucking love psychedelics I tell you, and uh, the reason being is that they help heal trauma. So, when I got that, well, actually, I didn't finish that education because I had to move to another city because of the job opportunities. So I was working for the advertising agents in Yekaterinburg, and they said, "Look, uh, I want to in Moscow." I was like, "Fuck, okay, I'm gonna go to Moscow." And then they stayed in Moscow and just, you know, quit the education. But then I went to coaching, and uh, yeah, that that one I like more because coaching is more about overcoming obstacles rather than getting stuck in the past uh, for me psychology is something like this but then again i got the necessary data for me <laughs> to fucking go on experiments and i love it uh there was this case we we're hanging out with my mates in the uh, it's like dacha it's a small house outside the city with uh, some nature and uh, privacy and things like this so everybody were having acid i had like four of us if i remember correctly so i didn't and they were tripping, like, you know, it's getting to the very peak of it. And at that moment, I say, okay, it's time. So I was there with them, like, catching their waves and everything. And I have this strange ability when people are on drugs, they can kind of feel it from them. I can feed, in a sense. I'm not an energy vampire, but I don't know. It's just something that works. So anyway, they, I reached within this peak. So I took acid and went to the forest. Well, what an experience. Um, well, I've been having a really good conversation with trees, with my subconscious, with the trauma that I had, and uh, with the loss of my father, and the grudges that I've held, and then I just... Oh, somebody didn't notice glass door, and... Uh, well, she's okay, she's okay. Well, anyway, um, so where were... Where were we? Uh, yeah, so second. Oh, yeah, trauma. So I was able to go through those aspects, and I'm not saying that I've healed at all because I'm in therapy. I'm in uh, therapy with the psychologist for over a year so far, a year and a half, and we're in the couples therapy as well because we uh, try to open up our relationship. We caused a bit of trauma to each other, so we're working on it, we're fixing it, but we're talking about it, which is great. So the reason is uh, I'm talking about all this is kind of, you know, leading to my next project. So my next project, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> fucking drum roll here. So I met this guy, um, Wesley, great guy. French guy, got both passports, French American, like perfectly for me as a Russian person, you know, I envy him. Like, dude, <laughs> you can do whatever you want, go wherever you want. Whereas I am just stuck with my fucking red passport. But anyway, so I went to Thailand with my wife. It, we went to Pangan, and uh, this is the place we've been to prior to the start of war. So we came 
we spent her like December and partially January. So we came back and the, the war started. We're like, okay, fuck. <laughs> there goes rest. And then we came here a second time and um, I realized that I'm just getting rid of my assets in Russia. So I, I had an apartment, I had a mortgage and decided to sell in 2021 because, well, uh, there was a good ratio of uh, currency exchange rate, so the ruble kind of strengthened. Nobody fucking expected that, that the, there is this Russian economy that does fucking magic tricks on the world and, you know, uh, the sanctions and the war starting and the ruble is just getting stronger and stronger and people are like, what the fuck is happening? But you'd be amazed, really, the Russian economy is still growing. This is insane. I mean, I tell you, uh, even though the sanctions and the isolation everything, of course, the problems are piling up and it's a matter of time when they kind of when shit hit the fan but the the death is not that high i mean that's really amazing it's really strange but i just don't get it but i mean of course you can explain it and go into the economics of it and shit like that but yeah let's go back to that project so uh that project that i started to talk to you about is uh um, originally idea of wesley so he wanted to make a, a spa kind of a resort but something like that and in uh, in thailand they've recently legalized cannabis so it's like a gold, gold rush pretty much so did they decided to make thailand like netherlands of southeast asia and they they've had like persecutions and i mean they didn't execute anybody if you had like hash or cannabis on you you wouldn't be killed or something like that but you'd be jailed pretty much for quite a long time and nobody would have wanted that so at some point in time you just decided fuck it let's legalize it and uh, for me it is like an insane shift but thailand is a very different country i mean they have their own rules they have the king and then they have this government and uh oof, I, I don't want to even go there but i mean i love thailand I, I love it especially with the cannabis being there so last time i came you go to the shop with like 40 50 varieties and you're like oh can i try each and every one please just just you know small puffs and samples or something but yeah i think i've tried maybe like 10 variations or something because i didn't have that much time to spend there a month and a half yeah so we went to the northern part of chiang mai pai amazing place I highly recommend it to visit uh pangan is a great place but it's getting fucking overcrowded so i bumped into this restaurant wesley and they had this um had because it's been closed now uh, because of the landlord she decided to not continue the the lease so there was this mexican restaurant fucking the name escapes me yeah you can take, take. so the name escapes me but there was like giant frida uh, frida cow uh, painted on the wall and it, it draw draws attention when you're driving in the scooter or car so he wanted to go to do this spa and he was looking for sponsors. I was like, dude, I just sold my apartment. Let's do shit together. So we immediately connected. And uh, since cannabis get legalized, we thought, okay, let's do some procedures with edibles. But then again, we weren't the first ones to do it. So we've been discussing this project for over, uh, I don't know, four or five months so far. And we're now building an eco resort on the mainland in um, in Thailand. So this is the place, I mean, we're still working on it, but it's going to be like an unplugged ranch. Well, that's a technical name. We're going to make, make come up with something more, something better. And it basically is going to look like this. So we did the research. We, we looked at others, like, what are they doing? Like, <laughs> what type of procedures are they offering and shit like that? And um, we decided, like, let's let's see what what is there. And we started to realize that there's this whole fucking segment of companies that are doing this psychedelic retreats. And what they're doing, they're targeting like big executives from big companies and offer them like a week package, where they basically just trip and heal trauma, and they charge like seven thousand or something like that for that week and we're like okay we can do something better than this and uh, we got a lot of ideas it's compiled and uh, we're gonna build it we're actually building it as we speak but um the thing is that this is like a really insanely exciting destination so i i, I definitely can call myself an advocate for psychedelics I have this background in terms of psychological education. 
I have like two certifications of coaching systems like International Association of Coaching and then there's Oxford Leadership Leading with Purpose which like completely changed my perspective in terms of purpose and what I'm doing with my life pretty much two years ago when I went through this and uh, I got the knowledge of psychedelics because I've been using them I know what trauma is I know how to work with it I decided like fuck I want to do it I mean, I want to heal people. I, this is something that I want to do because I, I want to help people change and, uh, you know, overcome those traumas that they have. So, yeah, we're working this project and it's, uh, build, it's being built up as we speak. Um, but, yeah, the reason I've highlighted this is that to bring awareness around psychedelics because, in a sense, if you, like, try to <laughs> stitch it together and think that what does it have to do with the fucking male ego here? It has to do a lot because once you are on psychedelics, especially on a, like a huge amount of it, like properly huge, but never, uh, disclaimer here, don't do it. <laughs> don't do drugs, especially, especially if you're not sure about the place and people surrounding you for the next 10 hours. If you have doubts, please don't do it. The thing with psychedelics is that it is not a party drug, definitely. You didn't, shouldn't be doing this, but if you know how it works, if you know how it affects on your psyche, if you are doing it in a proper setting with sitters, ideally, people who have this experience and can guide you through it and make sure that you, you know, won't spiral into deep paranoia or something. So. Once you've taken all those measures into account, it's going to be not just a life-changing experience as it is. It would be a moment of revelation. Because simply when you're high on LSD, your barriers, your protectors, your parts, your mental structures and your defense systems including ego pretty much they all go down and at that point in time you as a personality are naked not like physically of course but mentally so you are able to observe the world in a more comprehensive manner at the same time, you start to recognize your own defense mechanisms, structures, your own ego, your own clinging, desires, deep-rooted trauma. And once you realize it, you can work with it. Of course, provided that you have the desire to do it in the first place. Because if you don't need it, then fuck it, just forget about it. But again, just to give you a bit of a kind of ending here for this particular story is that psychedelics are coming back regardless of whether you want it or not. Don't fight it, just look at data, educate yourself, like Ignorance is something that holds people back and people will say that, oh no, it's bad, but then again you ask why? I, you know, I've been told, okay, why? By whom? I, you know, it was the state representative that told me, okay, so what are they doing? Are they trying to enforce some laws on you? That's it. But did they provide you with any sufficient data? Was it objective? Were there any numbers? Were there any studies? Were there any like bases to those claims? Because you'd be surprised, and especially after watching that TV show, is that all those scary stories are pure bullshit. <laughs> I mean, like seriously, somebody somewhere did something. They're like, "Oh, it's gonna happen to you." You're like, yeah, right, right, sure, okay, yeah, tell me about it, yeah, have you tried it? No, you have, mm, okay, that's interesting, so you now, okay, okay, that's good, and then I've tried it, I know, 
<laughs> I mean, I've had shit a lot of psychedelics. Oh yeah, talking about microdosing, um, this is a really interesting concept that helps uh, heal depression states. So I've uh, experienced that state several times over the course of my life, mainly during the period 2022 and 23, of course, but mainly 22 because of the fucking war started. So um, yeah, um, something that helped me, mushrooms. So mushrooms are other variations of psychedelics, more natural, more grown, but then again, there are countries where this is allowed, there are countries where this is illegal. So of course, those companies that I mentioned before, they are doing those resorts in their jurisdictions that are kind of okay with it, we're not enforcing any laws. But yeah, I mean, in Thailand, we're gonna go with the law, of course. I mean, we're not gonna break any laws or anything like that. If people wanna do it, it's up to them. We're not providing them with anything really here and uh, we're not ghosting any parties or anything. It's just, I don't know, strange intention. Somebody might think about it. It's no connection there. So yeah, anyway, mm, think about researching and before judging and this is something that um, happens with totally different topic like again going all the way back to the first topic that I started is the menstruation and the, uh, the sex education in the schools. I mean, when people are provided with sufficient amount of information, when people are being given with like knowledge and they know once they know they fucking behave differently so this is like exact same thing ignorance is stopping people from accepting reality and accepting facts because they have these pillars of their core identity saying oh no that's that's wrong somebody told me i'm not gonna do it and then you know it starts to shake and people feel insecure and shit like that so of course um situations like this if one's ego maybe really kind of touched, bruised, you know, because uh, they cannot allow themselves to kind of come to realization and really say out loud that they don't know something because, oh, fucking ego, male fucking ego, I tell you. So, yeah, I guess that's that's the ending for, for here for today. <laughs> Thanks for watching.